Opening day. That's the nothing personal word of the day. It is finally Thursday, March 28th, 2024. It's opening day, baby. I love opening days. There's a little pep in your step on opening day in baseball, whether you're involved in the game or not, whether you're a child, an adult, it just feels good. You had the date circled in your calendar. You wake up, you put on your Sunday best put on any rings you may wear, your left ring finger if you happen to have. I got my World Series ring here. I wear it every opening day. Opening day, weddings, bar mitzvahs, speeches during the World Series. Just a quick reminder how great it was to win a World Series. But opening day, I go through every opening day a mental Rolodex thinking about my 18 opening days, trying to go one by one, trying to do a memory test. You're not old, Dave. You can remember every opening day. There's certain that are just part of your inside out memories. They're the blue ones. Good thing inside out two is coming out because I can't remember inside out one, even though it's in my top 100, the color of the permanent memories that they never get smashed no matter what. How do you forget your first? Standing there in Olympic Stadium, nervous as all get out. Just April 3rd, 2000, I was 32 years old. I'm driving to Olympic Stadium and I'm thinking to myself, all I care about is just win my first game. I want to be over 500. I want to start the season because in Montreal, you had huge crowds opening day. After that, not so much. Let's give these fans something to remember. We had planned for months what the player introductions would be. We had players introduced through the crowd for those 55,000 people at that game. And I'm sure there's hundreds of thousands of Montrealers, Kia crew, who believe they were there. We had players introduced through the stands. They walked down. We had the mat wear their spikes because we didn't want to lay carpeting on the concrete inside Olympic Stadium. So they had to wear their, their turf shoes or their regular sneakers. They walked down. We had Michael Barrett, the catcher, propel down from the ceiling. Spoiler alert, it wasn't really Michael Barrett. Union wouldn't allow it. Nothing bad happened until the game. And then Kevin Brown of the Dodgers completely shoved it up our arses. Lost that opening day, walked into the clubhouse, looked at Felipe Alou and said, hey, great job. <clears throat> it was terrible. That was a good one. Opening day. Opening day of Marlins Park. That was another memorable one in 2012. We were the only game in baseball. We started the season against the St. Louis Cardinals. First game, ESPN, national audience, Marlins Park full. Josh Johnson strike one to Rafael for call. That was the end of that. We, I think we went hitless for five innings. Our whole crowd was there. The concession lines were out of control. It was really the first big, we had done practice events with the Yankees in town and we had done some college games, some high school games. We had some issues. There's always issues. People think that it's smooth sailing when you run a ballpark, but it's not. You're worried about everything. One of my first opening days, I think we ran out of hot dogs. Maybe my first opening day in Florida, we ran out of hot dogs and I got crucified by Greg Cody. Maybe it was Dave Hyde. We should look back. I should ask Cody on a Cody Tuesday on Levitard. Did you write that hot dog article? No doubt I could be conflating memories, but there was an opening day, except we didn't really run out of hot dogs. I remember saying to our ballpark operations people, and our concessionaire people, are you telling me there's not another hot dog in the place? And what happens is you allocate hot dogs to different concession stands and you allocate it according to where you think the crowd will be and where the tickets are sold in an opening day, they're everywhere. But there's certain concession stands that get more traffic than others because there's people roaming around, et cetera. So I think we had some concession stands run out of hot dogs. 
but clearly not the whole ballpark. Let's face it. We get a season's worth of hot dogs delivered day one. Those things have an expiration date of like six decades. Who runs out of hot dogs? It's impossible. Completely ridiculous. But funny. Players don't love opening day. I was texting with some players yesterday. Don't look at me, Louie. I was in the game a long time. I've got friends who are still playing. Opening day is such a distraction. Players are so routine-based. They want BP at the same time at home. They do the same thing. They shower pregame at the same time. They eat at the same exact time. We have clocks all over the clubhouse. There's digital clocks. There's analog clocks. Everything's by the clock. It's like we live inside the set of Castaway, the first scene with Tom Hanks over in Russia doing FedExes. TikTok, TikTok. And opening day, everything gets screwed up because there's more to do. There's more. The timeline gets changed. Players like the routine of game 69, where they just know when they get to the ballpark and that everything's fine. Opening day is one of hope for all of you. Every fan. I don't care if you're a fan of the Oakland A's and you say, I don't even have a team. Forget a chance. You do have a team and a chance. It's like having a chip in a chair. Did you like that, Coca? Where I mixed Vegas and Oakland and chip, chair, hope? Come on. That's pretty good for opening day at 8.07 Eastern Live on Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel. Thank you to everyone who's here watching it live. If you're on the DraftKings network, then it's 10.07. Welcome. Enjoy us. The thing that I enjoy about the season now now that I'm out of baseball, is I don't have to worry anymore about losing one nothing on opening day. There is no worse score. I've won and lost by many different scores on opening day. The worst one is to lose one nothing. We were sitting in Houston one year. I think we had uh, Dontrell going, Dontrell Willis going against Roy Oswalt. If you don't know who Roy Oswalt was, he was good. That's when the Astros had Berkman and Biggio and et cetera. Josh Johnson relieved Dontrell Willis. We lost that game on a wild pitch. We couldn't score. They went Oswald eight innings and then Brad Lidge, a phenomenal closer for the ninth inning. You go back to your hotel and you just sit there. Then you go out to dinner, of course, because you're starting the marathon of the season. But losing one nothing. I'd rather lose 10 to one. I've, I've lost the first game I ever had. I think we lost nine, four. I've lost six, two and one, six, two, but one, nothing, man, did that hurt. So when these teams start their season, one thing that the front office does not focus on at all, just so we're clear, are all the predictions. There was an article that the Yankees under one predictive service. We're going to win 81 games. Then one of them had 91 games. The front office doesn't do that. The analytics department doesn't do that. We know when a season starts, what we've evaluated the team to be. We know what our players are capable of and wins above replacement. We know what our players as a combination should be able to do. And that's the rough estimate of what we think has a chance to happen during the course of the season. Except there is not one team in baseball where their opening day roster will be their closing day roster. Not one. 0 for 30. Now you can project how long will Garrett Cole be out. And we do that when we have a starting pitcher injured to start the year or a position player with a rib, an oblique, a sphincter, whatever the position player has, we'll calculate, all right, we expect four to six weeks. Here's where we are in the schedule. So we do those exercises. But you know what? At the end of the day, so many things change. I've told you, you need 14 starting pitchers to get through the year. So don't evaluate a starting rotation. This is my favorite. Let's rank the starting rotations. When you're the president of a team, you look at that and you laugh. I'm sorry, you laugh. 
Now, rank me the top 14 starters of every team, and then we'll talk. But the top five, pointless. I was like strength of schedule. 42 of the first 68 games are inside the division against teams that finished last year with a winning percentage of 522. You want one loss over unders to go play? Maybe. I'm going to give you my picks. These are my wait to see total plays. Yesterday, I gave you my division winners, individual award winners, World Series winners. Have fun up there in Seattle. Yankees are 91 and a half. It's hard to win 92 games. You got to go 92 and 70 with Garrett Cole injured. Although Juan Soto's super happy, we're taking the Yankees under 91 and a half. How about Miami? Miami Marlins, two times in the playoffs since COVID. Brought in Tim Anderson. You got Jesus Lazardo starting opening day today. It's all very exciting, except their offense is not very good. Their pitching's pretty deep, but injured. 78 and a half under. Sorry. And I know that Marlins people are paying attention to this, and I love you guys. The two people still there. Love you. Dodgers, the team of the year. 103 and a half. Is that with or without Otani pitching? Spoiler alert, he's not pitching. Are you aware that the Dodgers rotation is only okay? 103 and a half under. How are the Philadelphia Phillies only 89 and a half? I have no idea how that's even possible. The Philadelphia Phillies with Nola and Wheeler at the top of their rotation. Another year with Harper. Schwarber can hit 169 with 50 bombs this year. Taking the over, Phillies, 89 and a half. The NL East is so mediocre below the Braves and the Phillies. The Braves are 101 and a half. I'm taking over Braves, over Phillies, because Marlins are going to be under, and then you've got Nationals and Mets. What about the World Series champion, Texas Rangers? They're down at 88 and a half. Well, I guess because they lost Jordan Montgomery. And maybe they'll have some mm-hmm. post-World Series hangover like what we had in 2004. That was a hangover. There was the thought that we would be good any particular day, except we stunk every day. I'm not exactly sure why we couldn't turn it around. The players said, oh, no, starting tomorrow, we're going to be good. I think Texas will not suffer that fate. And we're going to go over 88 and a half. The Jordan Montgomery led Arizona Diamondbacks. I guess no one believes it's Mariners over Diamondbacks in the World Series. Arizona's 84 and a half. Of course, I'm going over. Hey, I need to add one, Coca. What is Seattle's over under? While Coca's looking at that, I'm going to talk about our friends in Oakland when I said, hey, listen, have hope. You never know. You're O and O. You're in first place. Your over under is only 57 and a half. You can't win 58 games. Go 58 and 104. Piece of cake. Under. We're going under Oakland. 57 and a half. I want to add the Seattle total to that, Coca, because I have Seattle winning the World Series. And the Seattle total is 87 and a half. We're going to do what we did with the Diamondbacks and we're going to take the over on the Seattle Mariners. So Seattle over Arizona, both of their totals are over. We have the Yankees and Marlins missing the playoffs. Take them under. Dodgers in the playoffs, but under. Phillies and Braves in the playoffs, over. Texas in the playoffs, over. Oakland, under. Nothing personal pick of the day. Presented by DraftKings Fantasy Sports. Yes! Check out what DraftKings has to offer this season with Code Samson. Because life's more fun when you're in on the action. DraftKings, the crown is yours. We've got a sponsor for Nothing Personal Pick of the Day. And we are back to baseball. We had the Pacers last night giving 24 points. I don't know if you didn't have that line. But we did. Four, eight, six, nine. 
We had the Pacers getting 24 points last night. Don't know whether you did. We did. Still wasn't enough. Pacers got their butts kicked by the Bulls. We lost that pick. We are 36 and 41, limping into baseball season, but so excited to start. The season's only beginning. We're only at the end of March. That's like three months into the year. And we still have 75% of the year to get back, give you some good picks. Where am I watching? I'm watching the World Series champion Rangers. The thing about your first game when you raise the flag, we see this in basketball a lot. We spread out. We raised our flag the first home game of 04. And then the first Saturday night, we did the ring ceremony to get two crowds because people like seeing a ring ceremony. It's so cool to get your rings. It's so cool to see a banner that will forever fly in the home of the Texas Rangers. You bring your grandkids to a game and say, hey, I was part of that. Nady Evaldi gets the opening day start. I love him in opening day starts because his heartbeat is roughly 47, even when he's on the mound. He is calm, cool, and collected. But he's going against the Cubs, a team with a starting pitcher. Man, Steele is good. You should watch him. So instead of the game, we're going to start our nothing personal pick of the day presented by DraftKings Fantasy Sports with the under in that game of eight and a half. I'm looking for both of those pitchers to excel something like a 3-1 final. So take the under of eight and a half. That is your nothing personal pick of the day presented by DraftKings Fantasy Sports. What a day for David Rubenstein. It so rarely happens this way that you get approved to own a team the eve of opening day. I would not have wanted to change over control and lose my job on the eve of opening day. Give me one more season. Give me one more night. Just one more night. Angelo says, no more nights. I want to see that ownership transfer. David Rubenstein got unanimously approved in an owner's meeting. Uh, they didn't say it in the release, but just a little behind the scenes, the owners were not all together in an owner's meeting taking this vote. This was a phone vote. They do a conference call. 30 people get on it. One per team. Principal owners generally don't get on it. Some of them do but they have their team presidents get on. The head of the ownership committee makes a little statement. We've got a transaction to approve. We've sent you the documents. We are the executive council approved, the ownership committee approved. We now need your vote. All right, let's take a vote by phone. They go one through 30. David Rubenstein is not on the call. He's not allowed to be on the call. He can't hear what anyone's saying. John Angelos is on the call, but then has to get off the call. The vote comes in, and all of a sudden, the Angelos family is out. So they lost their father. They lost their team. And it's a 40% buy-in by Rubenstein. So for those of you that think that Peter Angelos died, and then all of a sudden, the Suns have $1.725 billion dollars in their pocket, they do not. David Rubenstein's group bought 40% of the team. That's 40% of the equity of the team. 1.725 is the enterprise valuation. You have to subtract debt from that, and the team has debt. Let's say for math purposes, they have 500 million in debt. That means that the equity is worth 1.2 billion. If you want to get 40% of that, that's 480 million. That's the amount that actually gets wired to close a transaction. Still a lot of money. That's a lot of asbestos. So David Rubenstein takes over. He needs a plan. When you take over at the end of a season, you have a whole off season to put your imprint on the team do things you want to do from a marketing standpoint, a sales standpoint, a player standpoint. 
Baseball would have you think that Rubenstein had nothing to do with the trade of Corbin Burns or Zaki. They would have you think that David Rubenstein was just sitting there watching everything happen while leases were signed with the Baltimore Stadium Authority to extend their lease. Triple horse hockey. When you know you're selling the team, which the Angelos have always known, you don't do one thing without consulting the person who's buying it. As a matter of fact, there are often contracts in place where there are certain actions that are prohibited by a seller in an interim period. But David Rubenstein now has control. He's the one who will go to the owners' meetings. And his first move as owner was to tell you that to own the Orioles is a great civic duty. On behalf of my fellow owners, I want the Baltimore community and Orioles fans everywhere to know that we will work our hardest to deliver for you with professionalism, integrity, excellence, and a fierce desire to win games. It's a heck of a start. But then I thank John Angelos and his family for all they've done to bring us to this point. And then he talks about what John's done. A dramatic overhaul of the management, roster, recruitment, strategy, farm system. Our job is to build on these accomplishments to advance a world-class professional sports agenda. How great is it that he buys a team and doesn't have to MF the previous guy on the way out the door? Now, granted, Angelo still owns 60% of the team, but that said, no power. How great is it that David took the high road? Derek, are you listening? You can take the high road, not the end of the world. You'll have time to make it your team. Make it your team. Makes me want to root for the Orioles, which I am. Baltimore is such a great city. Baltimore needs something great after the nightmare that took place with the bridge collapsing, the innocent workers who died, saved scores of lives making sure there were no trucks, or cars on the bridge, I believe. Does it make you nervous crossing a bridge now? I live in an, on an island where crossing bridges or going in tunnels really is super important if you're not going to be an agoraphobe, which I'm not, but I'm practicing to be. David Rubenstein is a smart man. He's got a 100-day plan. We're going to watch it unfold over 100 days. When you're a new commissioner, there are many of them. You have a 100-day plan. When you're a new owner, a new president, a new president of the U.S., everyone's got a 100-day plan. 100 days in baseball goes so fast, so fast. It's three and a half months. Think about that. It's, it's around the all-star break, which is going to happen. And I can't snap with the ring on because it's so big. Look at that. There's no sound if you can hear that. I used to be able to snap ringless, sort of like winking. I can only wink with one eye. Very strange. His 100-day plan, spoiler alert, there's money in it to add at the deadline. As a matter of fact, Coca, I'm going to add a wait to see, if you don't mind. Wait to see is when I tell you something's going to happen. If it does, great. If it doesn't, fine. We'll revisit it. By the trade deadline, this year, the Baltimore Orioles will have added. They are buyers. You know who else is buying? The LA Dodgers. God, they just keep doing it. They have one of the best catchers in baseball behind JT Realmuto. For me, he's the second best catcher, Will Smith. He is the starting catcher in LA. He just got a 10-year, $140 million deal on the eve of opening day. 10 years, $140 million. The Athletics says, only 45 million of it is deferred. Not bad. Added to the list of deferrals for the Dodgers. Guggenheim partners run by Mark Walter. No idiot. Smart guy. The reason why the Dodgers do all this deferral is you only have to fund deferrals two years after signing your deal. So for Otani, they have to fund a ton of it, but not for two years. And funding it is such a joke in the CBA. It's never really enforced. You only have to pretend you've got the money. 
you show it and account for a day and then remove it. And meanwhile, if you're in the financial industry, you take the money that you owe a player, you invest it over time, over 20 years, you're going to make money. And so you've profited off these contracts and the number is smaller for luxury tax purposes because the present value of the deal is not $140 million, on and on and on. Not every owner can get away with this. Not every owner can do this. This is like the original Madoff stuff. But here's the interesting part about all these deferrals that the Dodgers are doing. If something happens and the Dodgers sell their team with all these deferrals on the books, the way the Nationals are trying to sell their team with all their deferrals on the books, it totally screws up the value of your asset. Because a new owner, trust me, if a new owner buys this team in 10 years, they're not going to pay a dollar to Otani. If they buy this team in 10 years, they're not going to pay Betts or Freeman or Will Smith. That money is going to come off the top. And so what the owners say is, my team's worth $4 billion. What's the difference if I get a valuation of $3 billion? It's still a home run. God, I could absolutely rationalize away anything. Good for the Dodgers. All right, before we go to break, a quick shout out to Earl Santee. Congratulations, Earl. If you don't know the name, hear me now and listen to me later. Earl Santee is now the chair and CEO of Populous. Populous is the architectural firm who built Marlins Park and just about any park you go to. They used to be called HOK. Then he branched off to become Populous. I worked with Earl Santee every day to make Marlins Park the beautiful park that it is, aesthetically, outside, inside. He designed every single room from an equipment closet to the showers in the visiting auxiliary locker room. The documents are thicker than my fingers can go at only 5'5", five, five, now buck 39 because I'm a lazy bum. More than that thick. It's like four inches. All right, when we come back, we're going to review one of my top 100 movies, and then we're going to talk about what happened in Virginia. Ted, I'm tipping my cap to you. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. We are here with you Monday through Friday. You can listen to us. You can watch us live on YouTube. You can watch us on the DraftKings Network. Just keep telling your friends about us. Thank you for last month. We'll see what March was. February was a record for us. We keep setting records every month. So let's keep going. We might as well. Monday through Friday. Every day I watch a movie. Every day. Every day I write the book. Coca could say every day I read the book. But every day I watch the movie. Chapter one, little Elvis Costello for you in the morning. We're reviewing my top 100, every movie in my top 100. Where is your top 100, people might ask. Go to davidsampsonpodcast.com, and there's a link to a document that has every one of my picks of the day, every one of the word of the day, every movie we've reviewed, it's all right there in a document, plus the top 100 list, plus on that website, davidsampsonpodcast.com. You can look and see where we're doing live, nothing personals, whether we're coming to your city. Spoiler alert, we're going to be in Philadelphia this coming Tuesday in only a few days, Coca. Today is what? Today is Wednesday. A week from yesterday, we will be in Philadelphia, which is quite exciting. We'll be ready. Come join us. So I watched the King's speech. Oh, Sorry, Coca. Today's Thursday. Let's do that entire um, thing again, if you don't mind. All right, here we go. I want to I wanna preview our Philadelphia show and get right into the review. Four, eight, six, nine. Every day I watch a movie, and if you want to hear us live review a movie or do any part of this show, and you want to do a So You Want to Talk to Samson segment, come see live, nothing personal, starting in Philadelphia. This Tuesday, that's in five days, April 2nd. Go to davidsampsonpodcast.com and we've got 
a link for your tickets. I watched the King's speech. I don't remember what number that is in my top 100. That's a movie starring Colin Firth. He won an actor Oscar, best actor. It won best director. It's my 55th favorite movie. Best screenplay, the writer just passed away. Best director, Tom Hooper. It's a movie about King George VI, who was a stutterer, only became the king because his brother abdicated the throne to marry a woman who the royal family said, don't you do that, don't marry her. Yeah, but I'm in love. Love conquers all. And that's how you get Prince Harry. Think about that for one second. Without the abdication, there is no Prince William, Prince Harry, Prince Charles, Lady Di, none of it. It all started back then because King George VI became the king and his daughter was Queen Elizabeth. Otherwise, it would have been on the other side, but he had no children and he abdicated. The King's speech is phenomenal. Jeffrey Rush. I, one of the most powerful performances, if I had to give top 10 performances, non-World War II related, Jeffrey Rush and Colin Firth together in the King's speech would be likely in my top 10. So if you have a chance to watch it and you haven't, you will learn something. It will shock you to see King, Queen Elizabeth as a child and think, wow, that's the queen who got old and had Charles. All right, so now we're going to go live to a document that was done by one of the fans of Nothing Personal, which is a living document, which helps us randomly choose the next movie that we're gonna review next Thursday. I should have known it was Thursday, Coco. This is when we do these reviews. All right, show that on the, on the screen if you can. Now, hit a number and that's the next movie. All the ones in yellow we've reviewed, the ones in green we have not. I cannot believe I'm putting on my 175s, baby. Do I get to review About Time? Number 39 with Dom Gleason and Rachel McAdams and Bill Nahi? Yes, I watch it practically once a week anyway. So I'm excited I get to watch that. About Time is my favorite time travel movie. It is a movie that will make you cry. Coke, I got a side story for you before we move on to Virginia. I was feeling a little verklempt a couple days ago, two nights ago, Tuesday night. Got two episodes of a show that I go to when I'm feeling a certain way, because I like when I'm feeling sort of down, I want to revel in that. And when I'm feeling up, I want to revel in that too. I want to just embrace how I'm feeling at a particular moment. I watched the last 16 minutes of the final Ted Lasso with father and son, the song played by Cat Stevens. Water works every time. And then I backed it up with the finale of season two of Shit's Creek, back to back Jacks, which is the anniversary episode where the family gets, <laughs> oh my God. Whew. Coke, I'm very emotional today. It's opening day. Do I get a pass? For those of you watching me for the first time on DraftKings Network, this is nothing personal. Yes, sometimes I cry in the air. I was crying with happiness when Ted Leonsis announced yesterday, we've got a deal. That's outstanding. He announced that a month ago. I figured that's fantastic. He's got a deal in Virginia. He had the governor. He had that person in the Senate in Virginia say, no, your deal's dead on over my dead body. Will you get financing to make yourself even richer and develop 6,900 acres around an as yet built ballpark? I figured the deal was done. And then I read the article. It turns out the deal's done in DC. <laughs> it's so good. The wizards and the capitals are not moving to Virginia. They're staying right where they are. Ted's playing chess and the public officials were playing checkers. Ted went so far as to have a press conference announcing the Virginia deal, holding hands with the governor of Virginia, making sure out of his left eye, going like this if you're watching, 
I'm quickly squinting to my left. Hey, you watching DC? Are you paying attention? You don't think we're really done in Virginia, right? We're announcing this, but we have no deal. We're not even close to a deal. DC, we really want to deal with you. There's no way this will get done in Virginia. Hey, DC. Hello. Hello. He was talking to DC the whole time. Brilliant. Page three of the playbook. Now he announces a deal with a totally different set of public officials. A huge, huge deal. And then he sends an email out and a statement to all of his fans saying, hey, it was always you, baby. Do you ever feel like that when you're at the end of a night, you go back or you're texting an old girlfriend or an old boyfriend, whatever, an old friend? Hey, it was always you. Hey, but haven't you been trying to get with everybody else? Yeah, yeah, but it was always you. I've had to make those calls many, many times to public officials. It was always you. I really always wanted to be on the Orange Bowl site. I swear to God, it was my first choice. Well, what about the times you visited other cities? Ah, I was just kidding. What about all the other sites you wanted in Miami that weren't the Orange Bowl site? Oh, please. I was just trying to get you where I wanted you. Ted said, it's a great day and I'm really relieved. I've got a news flash for you, Ted. The deal's not done in D.C. either. <laughs> it's so good. It's just so good. He's been telling us throughout that there may be some sort of bait and switch happening. He sent out something. I look at outcomes, not process. That's my kind of guy. That's a consequentialist. I look at outcomes, not process. And we got to the right outcome. I know this was a difficult process, and I want people to understand how much I love Washington, D.C. <laughs> Do you not remember the press conference you did in Virginia when you basically looked at the camera and said, Virginia's for lovers, and I am a lover. Now it's, it just makes me want to sing. What have you done for me lately? Bum, ba -dum, bum, bum. What do you think? Will the deal get done in DC? Or is this just being used to get the people in Virginia to get back on it? No matter what email you're seeing, no matter what letter you're reading, the deal in DC is not quite finished. I'll believe it when I see the flow of funds. That's sort of my background is show me, don't tell me. Because everyone is so full of it. But it is funny the number of press conferences we see, deals that are done when they're not quite fully baked. That's like when you're making someone a birthday cake and you have to hurry up out the door because you're late to the party. Maybe I'm the only one who's done this and you pretend it's done so you skip the toothpick routine because the toothpick shows you that it's not done. So what you do is you take the cake out, you go to the birthday party, people cut the cake and you say, oh, sorry, thought it was done. Hi, my name's Sue Sternberg. We're done in St. Petersburg. Oh, sorry. Don't worry. People eat raw eggs for breakfast. Rocky does. Premature celebration. I bet Ice Cube didn't want anyone to know that he offered Caitlin Clark $5 million to play in the big three. Do you agree? Ice Cube was doing it super duper undercover. If you don't know what the big three is, uh, you're not alone. The big three is a league started by Ice Cube. For foregoing anything about Ice Cube, not talking about Ice Cube, let's talk about the concept. It's three people, three players. Generally, they're not of age. They're, that's Let me say it a nicer way. They are of age. They're not of prime age. Now, let me say that a little differently because I feel prime right now. They're prime the way I'm prime, which is I can be prime, but you don't want to see me behind the scenes. I don't mean like from a makeup standpoint. I mean like, oi, my back, oi, vey, I can't feel my wrists, that sort of thing. I can run 20 miles, but uh, do I need to recover? 
Caitlin Clark, why would you offer $5 million? What's the math on that? The math is that you go to your broadcast partners and you say, if I do this, can you give me that? And then you get it out there that you've got enough money to offer the $5 million, except at the end of the day, you know very well that Caitlin Clark's going to say no. So you get the credit for A, having asked Caitlin Clark for being this amazingly forward thinking person and for not actually having to pay her. I can't imagine Caitlin Clark doing that, but she could. She's going to the NBA, WNBA. She already said that. We know that there's three point contests that take place between men's players and women's players. That happened with Steph Curry. We know that Caitlin Clark could easily be the best player on the court with the other members of Big Three who are all collecting AARP as I am. Just kidding. I throw that shit out, don't you? Oh, sorry, Coca. Take that out. I get AARP stuff in the mail. I don't even open it. I don't want your movie discounts. Out. Throwing it away. And what about those communities that are over 55? What? How about over 75? Then we'll talk. I'm still going to be here doing this show with you. We got 20 years left, Coca. I really don't think that this is interesting to me. Five million for eight regular season games and two playoff games. Let me do the math. 10 games, half a million dollars a game. And she can play in the WNBA. Why would she ever turn that down? What would be the reason? All right, Coca, play me some music. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson. That's from a movie called Half Baked. If you are 68, 69 baked, you will appreciate Half Baked. Or if you are zero 69 baked, you will still laugh. Get in there, davidsampsonpodcast.com, ask me a question. Go on X at David P. Sampson. Hi, David. Come to Columbus, Ohio for a show. I forwarded this to our tour manager. Right now we're doing Philly and Boston and Atlanta and Nashville, New York, Pittsburgh. Just go on our website, davidsampsonpodcast.com. Go to my ex and it's right. No, no, go to my Twitter account. Don't go to my ex. I don't think she's got the tour schedule. Hi, David, come to Columbus, Ohio for a show. I would like to know what goes on behind the scenes on contract incentives, as well as conditions on trades. Would a team really sit a player to avoid them realizing a contract incentive and or sit a player to avoid giving a team a better return for a conditional draft pick? Thank you. I want that to marinate because Coca gets upset with me when I'm too harsh with what's real behind the scenes. He wants you fans, he respects you, of course, but he really wants you fans to believe in the magic that is sports and the love that all the executives have for their players and the respect for their fans and their appreciation for your emotional well-being. Coca, turn off your earphones, get out of my ear so I can answer this person's question from Columbus, Ohio. You bet your bippy we pay attention to these things. We have it written out for us by our legal department and by our baseball department. We know of every single contractual incentive that is pending that particular year, and we know the amount from making the all-star game to getting a gold glove to whether or not there's a payment, if there's a trade, a tax equalization. We know every incentive. We've got it all. Because when we are doing trade discussions, we've got to keep track. When we're doing lineups, we've got to keep track of where players are trending. Does that mean that we don't want to win? No. Are there times when it would not matter to me where there was a player incentive, like game started and we had the best pitcher, we wanted him to start. If we are out of the race, let's take a great example, the Arizona Diamondbacks. The Diamondbacks know when they signed Montgomery that they're paying him 25 million this year. They know they have an vesting option of 25 million next year. 
they know that if he starts 10 games, it's 20 million bucks. He's going to start 10 games. 18 games, he gets another two and a half. But then for the next five games, if he starts 23, that's yet another two and a half million. So they have to pay him 25 million instead of 22 and a half million. If the Diamondbacks are in last place languishing with no chance to win at all this year, are they going to make sure that Montgomery gets his 23rd starts for an extra two and a half million dollars? There are no teams who don't pay attention. And we get criticized. I don't understand. There was a team, Coca, please remind me. They paid Joe Flacco. Is he the one who they sat for the final game of a meaningless regular season game, but he missed out on 75 grand in incentives? So his team, I think the Browns, but I can't think of it right now, just wrote him the check for 75 grand. And when I came out and said, don't do that, and there were people on the internet, oh my God, what a cheap bastard you are. No wonder you're so hated. Let me just ask you and your business. I want you to go to work today and ask your boss a question. If you have a chance to pay me $75,000 less, are you going to take that opportunity? You can give nice things and have people enjoy working for you. You can do nice Christmas parties. You can be nice when you see them in the hallway. You can ask them how their family's doing. But you have a responsibility to take care of money. So you're asking whether or not teams can take care of or pay attention to contract incentives. When we're doing contracts with players, when we're negotiating levels, the negotiations happen like this. We'll sign with you for a 10 million base salary, but we want an extra 5 million if he gets 400 plate appearances. And we would look at the player and say, that player always gets 400 plate appearances. He never gets hurt, knock wood, and we're hitting him at the top of our lineup. That's like giving him money guaranteed right now. We'd go back and say, how about 700 plate appearances? And the agent would say 700, that means he's gotta be healthy all year. Yeah, that's what we're expecting. When we're paying a guy that much money, we'd like him to actually do his job. It's like you at your job. Hey, I know that I get four weeks vacation and then 10 personal days off. And my salary is 80 grand. But I'm really only going to work 40 weeks. I hope that's okay. I think your boss would tell you to stick it. So, of course, we're paying attention to when we give on where plate appearances are or how we give on whether or not pitchers can achieve their games finished. That's a common one with relievers. How many games finished? You can't do saves. Games finished. That means you're the last person to throw a pitch for your team that particular game. It doesn't mean you end the game. It means you're the last pitcher for your team. Do we pay attention? Yes. Does it get negotiated? Yes. Are there times that we tell a player, if you don't agree to be traded, we will not play you? The Marlins, in theory, not with me, did it to Giancarlo Stanton and said, we're happy if you don't want to waive your no trade clause, but we're not going to play you. Or if we do, you're going to be surrounded by a team of nobodies and you're going to be despondent. That is normal for teams to do. I want to close today. God, there's so much we didn't get to, Coca. But I want to close today with opening day. In just a few hours, it was supposed to be 1 o'clock Eastern, but the weather's so bad on the East Coast, the games in New York, there's nothing worse than having opening day ruined for you. You look forward to the 28th, and all of a sudden, no, no, I meant the 29th. As a player, you just want to get started so badly. The delay of a day totally stinks. You want an off day later in the season. So you can relax, let your body heal. You don't want to miss opening day. Two games are already. So that's four teams not opening today. Dodgers and Padres, that's six teams not opening today. That still leaves 24 teams opening. You never know what's going to happen. That's the best part about sports. It's the rebirth. It's the hope. It's the dream that one day you'll get this. That's a ring. It's just business. Have a great opening day. This is nothing personal.